Greetings and welcome to Rain Hamcast podcast number 90, posted June 3rd, 2023. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. In this edition, our second excerpt from an autobiographical presentation given by ham radio author and cheerleader, Gordon West, WB6NOA. This entertaining presentation was first heard on Eric Guth, 4Z1UG's weekly hour-long QSO Today podcast in August 2019. By popular demand, we brought you an excerpt from Gordo's story last time in podcast number 89. Here now is our second excerpt from Gordo's life story. 74 was one of my first years at the Dayton Hamvention. And as I traveled around, everybody wanted me to write articles for different magazines about both marine and ham radio. So I ended up with writing for a CQ magazine, 73 magazine in the early 70s, popular communications, world radio, nuts and bolts. (laughs) It was fun. I'd get about 80 or 100 bucks for each article. And wow, this was easy money. So I was having a fun time, and I began to have some great times with our readership that certainly knew a lot more technical than I know, because I had graduated not with an engineering degree from college, but a business degree. So all went well in the 70s, and about the mid-70s, a phone call came in saying, how would you like to work for a company that produces a ham radio, single sideband radio? Wow, you mean not a modified one, but a a real single sideband. So I said, where are you located? And he says, well, we're near the Bay Area. And the company was Sideband Engineers, the SBE. And their big deal was the SBE 33 and 34. But SBE said, we also want you to work and head up our CB radio division. So in the 70s, I did a lot of traveling from Orange County up to sideband engineers. I'd stay up there for a week and then come back down and have a few days with Susie here. It was also in uh, 75, 76 that I needed a good mode of transportation, so I had to retire my black Corvair and launched my brand new vehicle that everybody could not believe after I outfitted it with radios, and it's a 1976 Chevy Malibu wagon, chrome wheels. That wagon soon had plenty of radio gear in it. It was quite the rig, and I still have it. It's in the garage. It's standing tall. It does have a new engine. If anybody's interested in a 76 with a lot of radio gear and coax in it, let me know. It still works great. And the wagon worked in quite nicely because beside doing the ambulance, I was also working in the summertime on weekends as a lifeguard down just south of Newport Beach, where they had some pretty mighty waves. And where we were located, we couldn't get an ambulance ambulance down there. So we had to put him in the back of the wagon and take him to the top of the hill. So the wagon did a lot of double duty. Well, then after a sideband engineers, they had me traveling all over the country uh, representing SBE CB radios, as well as the SBE 33 and 34 ham radios. And they were really more involved in CB radios because that's where the real numbers were in selling thousands of CB radios. With my very early years as a CB radio operator on Class D CB, it was fun. And they discovered that I loved to do seminars. So I would do CB radio seminars for CB radio dealers on how to better sell their CB radios. Then it happened in about the mid-70s from Out of almost no word, the FCC said we're going to be opening up the CB radio band, 23 channels to 40 channels. Wow. Is this great for the CB radio operators? Yep. Was it great for the CB radio sellers that had thousands of 23 channel radios around? Nope. It was death. And many of the companies could not compete with any profits because for every 40-channel radio we sold, 
we gave away not only one, but maybe two 23 channel radios to try and keep the sales going. So it was a tough time for SBE, but they took good care of their dealers. They gave deals upon deals. And I have fond memories of both standard communications as well as sideband engineers for launching my career into ham radio. So reluctantly, I left SBE and began doing more and more ham shows. And in the 80s, Susie and I got married. We finally moved into our uh, permanent house here in Costa Mesa. And I was still doing a lot of seminars, working with companies from Pace that Susie represented, Pace Electronics for CB radios in the early 80s, as well as boat shows, because sideband engineers came out with the industry's first digital CB radio tied with high gain that came out with the first digital marine VHF. SBE had the first keyboard marine VHF that we called Keycom. So I continued to do a lot of work with SBE as a consultant doing the boat shows. At the same time, I was just fascinated with ham radio, and that was my real love. Well, my real love was radio, but we had a phone call one morning. It was a gentleman asking about my ham radio classes that I started in the early 70s through a local college district. And he says, I understand you're doing classes, and I understand that you are doing your own little uh, question and answer book with a plastic comb bound book that we uh, took to our local print shop and Susie and I would literally do page by page to put it together and it was selling very nicely for our classes selling for like two bucks a piece and the spell says we would like you to write a book for us because I know of your work in marine electronics and we'd like for you to maybe come out with some study books that would along a CB frame get more CBers into ham radio and I go, oh, okay, um, uh, what's the name of your company? And this was Bob Miller, who's still alive today, good friend, lives in Arizona. And Bob Miller says the name of our company is Radio Shack. Well, I said, oh, Radio Shack? You want me to do a book for Radio Shack on ham radio? Yep. So the early 80s, I started pulling together a book for Radio Shack. And at the very first, the ham community goes, oh, Gordo, you're selling to like CB radio operators to get them into ham radio. Well, yeah, that's why I got started. So it was a couple of years at uh, ham shows that the hams would sort of scowl at me inviting uh, other radio services to join ham radio. But what they found out was those CB radio operators that were getting tired of the foul language they were soon hearing in the 80s from all the truckers. Because No, not the truckers' foul language. It was just the foul language throughout the band. They came from everybody, not just truckers. The truckers actually were using CB the way you intended to stay in touch with each other till the band opened, and then they loved doing the DX. Anyway, I explained to them that those that studied the Radio Shack book, as well as five word per minute code cassettes. Gosh, remember the cassette tapes? We had a great time. And finally, at Dayton, they said, you know, this is really working out fairly well. So for probably four or five years, I worked with Radio Shack. Then a company working closely with Radio Shack about a mile away called Master Publishing put together a deal where Master Publishing would then take over the arduous job of printing the books, of editing the books. I would still continue to write the books. And they were still sold by Radio Shack, but now Master Publishing could also sell them to uh, ham radio dealers that were really thriving in the 80s throughout the country. At the same time, our classes were going on. Susie was so great to put up with me almost every weekend doing weekend classes. Oh, my gosh. When the hams heard, get a tech license in two days, you're out of here, Gordo. You're listening to an autobiographical presentation presented by Ham Radio Sparkplug, Gordon West, WB6NOA. We'll conclude this excerpt from Gordo's story after this break for station ID. This is Classic Rain Hamcast number 21. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 
We'll be right back. You're listening to Classic Rain from www.therainreport.com. Don't miss on 220 at 220. Sunday's here on the WM9W. Good guys repeat her on 224.52 or a 110.9 PL. KC9RP, Des Plaines, Illinois. But as it turned out, when they came to the class to see how I was giving away ham tickets in just two days of training, they saw that we would send the students ahead of time my book, would send the students taking my classes ahead of time the home study materials. They would see all the correspondence between these students. So by the time they came to my weekend class, two days, these students could probably pass the test because they knew they were involved in something that required some work, required plenty of homework ahead of time. And then the two-day class is when I showed them, beside the Q&As on learning the material, I then applied it to the real world of ham radio with demos, lots of demos. And in our classes, it gave me an opportunity to say, Wow, I wish we had a ham class back when I was studying, because before then, the league certainly had their good technical manuals, but they were far too technical for me just to get an entry level or a general class ticket. And while I tried to learn the material, it just wasn't the same of working the real stuff, getting my nose out of the book and nose into the tubes and transistors in these radios. So in the late 80s, a ham class is going strong all over the country. We also offered eight-week classes, but I found out that the eight-weekers through the college system were not near as popular as get your license in two days. But, of course, you do have to home study ahead of time. And that was my hook that would reel these folks in, was to promise them a two-day class and then hit them with all sorts of home study and my fun comments and uh, little newsletters to our students to make sure that they would continue to go ahead. And they did. So in the early 90s, the classes were going just great. Do a class every couple of weeks here in the local area. And then I started doing classes as far south San Diego, including a class in Mexico for the USA ham license for Mariners. Then I started doing the classes as far north as Alaska. These ham radio classes were quite effective because all of the students had to study my stuff ahead of time, and that helped me be sure that my books were accurate, that Master Publishing was working over, and that all of the Q&As really related to the real world of ham radio. This created interest of my ham radio books that I would be writing about in many of the ham magazines. Master Publishing had a program where I went through several of the different directors running Master Publishing. Finally, went to Chicago for the call book to have a shot at it. Went to New York City, where a New York group did publishing for a couple of years, working with Master. And finally, Master Publishing came back to Chicago, as well as Texas, where we remember W5YI, Fred Maya. Fred was a very instrumental in helping get the books really rolling. And about the 1990s, because of my marine electronics interest, I saw a need for a GROL, commercial book. So I was one of the first to write a commercial book based on Q&As, as opposed to the excellent Kaufman, Electronic Communications by Schrader. These were wonderful books and continue to be in my library. But I found a lot of technicians, after they would read those books, would want sort of a review before taking the commercial exam. And that's when the commercial exams began to become privatized, like the ham radio exams in the 80s. The 90s were a busy one for me, traveling all over the country, as well as continuing my work with the Radio Club of America, where in the 90s they'd made me a fellow. I was quite honored for that. QCWA got me involved. It was just fun. And oh, yeah, I got my advanced and my extra in the 80s and 90s, as well as, of course, passing the general on the first time. But boy, I was nervous on that 13 word per minute code test because the FCC would be like looking over your shoulder as you are doing the code copy. And at the FCC office, this is a classic one. You're probably one of the first to ever hear the whole story. At the FCC office, when that fellow would stand over 
remember you watching you copy. The headphones that we were used were high gain, and they were picking up signals off of electromagnetic loop that ran around the top of the FCC testing room ceiling. I would regularly take students up there for code and theory tests, and I said for the code test, I said, you're going to put on these inductive headphones, and as you move your head around, you're going to hear some hum and so on. But I said, don't worry, a voice will come over saying, this is an FCC and so on. Dick Bash was also coming out with stuff at that time. Uh, Dick wanted me to get involved with his operation. He would actually send students to go there and try and memorize the test questions as well as the code, but the 80s and 90s, that's when the program was turned over to the private sector. And that concludes our second excerpt from Gordon West, his story. You can catch Gordo's entire one-hour autobiography on QSOToday.com. Episode 264. We'll be back with Rain Hamcast podcast number 91 on June 17th. Copyright 1985. 2023 Rain, the Radio Amateur Information Network. All rights reserved. You are encouraged to download, share, post, and transmit the Rain Hamcast podcast in its entirety via amateur radio. Thanks to Tom Shimizu, N9JDI, for posting a not for broadcast version of these podcasts via the Rain Report channel on YouTube. Now for the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR 73, and remember to keep on hamming.